Hello all and welcome. My name is Margaret. I'm a historical customer and textile conservator in training. And today we have a very exciting video. This is my first conservation treatment video on this channel, which is super, super exciting. Please note, I'm not working in a traditional lab space for this video. I have my kitchen table and some basic equipment. So I will pop in where I would have used more technical equipment if I had access to it for this particular treatment. Just be aware of that. Not everything is totally ideal in this situation, but still using the techniques that I would be using in a lab and I feel that the object was safe the entire time and that the product was great. You can tell I have been talking all weekend. I had some social events, so my voice is a little crackly, but not so, so bad that I didn't want to film this video for you. So let's get into what I will be conserving today. So I have a lovely sampler. This is a Scottish sampler by Jane Bird, worked in 1870 something, we'll get into that. But I found this sampler while I was in Edinburgh. I did a summer internship in Glasgow last summer. I will pop the vlog up here and down below if you wanna see some of my adventures out in the UK. Of course, me being me, I did a lot of vintage and antique shopping while I was there, possibly too much. I had like four suitcases by the time I went back home. I was a hot mess on the cobblestone streets, let me tell you. So I was in Edinburgh, popping around as one does, and I found this little antique store that was going out of business. I had to go in, of course. It was a little bit cramped in there, there was a lot of stuff, but when I was going through some prints and framed photographs, I came across this sampler. The frame was broken, the glass in the frame was broken, it was obvious that it was not the original frame, so that wasn't an issue. I ended up paying about $40 for it, which if you know prices on antique samplers is not very much. I thought I got a good deal. I was like, okay, I'm a textile conservator, like I can save this situation. I ended up just discarding the broken glass and the frame in a trash can on the street because I did not see a reason to be touting around broken glass and the framing was not up to standard anyway, so I just checked that. I took the sampler, put it in a bag, and carried it throughout the rest of my journey. Before we get into the specifics of this sampler that I found in Edinburgh, I do wanna talk about samplers more generally. There's been a lot of research and writing on samplers. If you wanna learn more, I will put some internet leaks down below, but a book that I highly recommend Let's see, it's down here, you can't see it. Let me fish it out. Okay, so a book that I highly recommend if you wanna learn more about samplers, and I know this is a lot, but this is Betty Ring's Girlhood Embroideries Volume One and Two. Check to see if it's in your library because this puppy is a spendy little book. Actually, I found this on the same trip in Canada. My first stop in Canada, I found this for a good deal and I was like, I need to bring this home. Touted this around my entire time in Europe. Um, but anyway, this is a really good one. Girl Embroidery by Betty Ring, if you want to learn more. So samplers, there's a lot of misconceptions about them, I feel. They were used in girls' education from about the late 16th, early 17th century until the end of the 19th century, depending on what school you were in. The Catholic schools, the more conservative schools, definitely kept them around longer. But these objects were intended to be sort of an academic exercise. So in the early days, in the 17th century, those long band samplers, those were used more as a repository for embroidery designs that one could show what kind of embroidery designs they could do and then pick if they were to embroider a shirt or something. But as it moved on, it became a more codified academic exercise that was supposed to teach girls the basics of stitching, marking, which is using embroidery to essentially initial your garments and linens so when they went to the laundry they would come back to the right person. That's why there's letters on there. It's not necessarily for literacy, it's for marking specifically. They were also often used to record family history, the initials or names of family members, sometimes some religious devotion, and oftentimes specific fancy work embroidery skills like darning, or gold work, etc. Now these samplers were also supposed to teach important life skills like patience and perseverance. 
and all of those wonderful things that we learn during our childhood activities that we might not keep into adulthood. But finishing one of these samplers was a big deal. It would often be mounted and then displayed in the girl's home for all to admire. So again, check the links down below if you want to learn more about samplers, but that's sort of the TLDR on samplers. They were popular in Europe, the UK, and in the Americas, including in Mexico and South America. So they were very universal in girls' educations throughout those centuries in the Eurocentric world. So let's talk about our sampler specifically. So this sampler was worked by a young Scottish girl named Jane Bird in 1870-something. There is no last number on that date. It might be 1807. It might be 1870, whatever the the number is after that. I have, haven't even seen evidence of her working the last number, so I don't think that she did. I think she ran out of space and was like, people will know it's 1870 something, or 1807. So I don't actually know, and I wasn't able to dig into the genealogy to figure that out, but I'm gonna go with 1870s on the date here. The sampler has a sort of open weave linen ground, very typical of the period, with three different colors of wool threads worked into it. There is also that black thread um, on just some of the lettering as well. The wool is just overall faded, which we can't do anything about, but there were some slight little bits of what I think is the original color on the back of this sampler. So I created this wonderful little Photoshop rendition of the colors that the sampler might have looked like, and we're gonna use this image to discuss the patterns on the sampler so that you can e more easily visualize it. So the sampler, still very supple, still very flexible, didn't need a ton of work. What it did need was to get taken off this board and remounted so it could be preserved for a longer period of time. So that's what this main body of the video is going to be about. However, we're gonna talk a little bit about what makes this sampler so Scottish and also the design elements that Miss Jane Bird worked in. So we're just gonna to go top to bottom here. We're just gonna read this sampler. We start off this sampler with these smaller worked letters. Again, this is for marking with some beautiful bands in between. Now we move down, there are two lines of initials. These are most likely relatives and the black indicates relatives that are potentially deceased. Then we move down to the central pictorial element of the sampler. As you can tell, it is off center, but it has some, not uniquely Scottish motifs, but some very common Scottish motifs. This includes tree of life motifs, which are those kind of little guys with the pom-poms. Those also might be berry bushes, but either way, super Scottish. We have the two peacocks, which are also very Scottish. And then we have a bunny rabbit, a bluebird, some love hearts, and what I think are dogs. But also might be squirrels, some type of small mammal. Don't know which one, your guess is as good as my guess. Comment down below, what do you think that little, those two little small mammals are? Moving along, we then have Jane Bird's name with the date, and then a line of strawberries. Now, strawberries are a very popular Scottish motif and also a very popular fruit in Scotland. Scottish strawberries are world class. The weather is good for something and it, that, that thing is berry growing. If you haven't been to Scotland, if you have been to Scotland, you need to eat their strawberries. Okay, get on it right now. We then move down into three lines of larger sort of open work letters with some beautiful wave motifs. And then uh, the line of numbers one through 13. And that is the end of the sampler. I will put some examples that I think are very similar to this sampler. It does have that traditional schoolwork Scottish feel to it. So. Let's dive in to the treatment. Okay, so let's talk condition of this sampler before we start any treatment on it. And I will talk you through what we're gonna do and the plan. So this is a sampler, late 19th century probably. You probably heard me talk about all this in the intro. But as you can see, there are several main um, condition issues. First, Obviously the ground fabric is very yellowed and discolored. Um, the wool sort of stitching 
threads are very, very faded. So this was probably on display for a, for a long time. It has those hallmarks of Scottish samplers, including those beautiful little strawberries and all that jazz. So not in like the most fantastic of conditions in terms of the fading and the discoloration of that linen or cotton ground fabric. But the real issue is that it's glued onto this board and it needs to come off of this board because this is a low quality acidic board and it's animal glued on there. So we need to get that off somehow without physically damaging the object too much. So my idea for this treatment is first we're going to test all of the different colored threads to make sure that nothing is fugitive. Second goal is to get it off of this cardboard. So I'm going to try to use a heated knife to sort of lift this off. If that doesn't work, we're probably gonna have to do a poultice with water and we can discuss what that is later. And then the third goal, if the dye is color fast, we're gonna wet clean this thing. And then last but not least, we are going to make a new mount for it and mount the piece on it so that it can be safely stored and easily displayed. So that is what we are going to do for this piece. Obviously, she needs some help, but you know, overall she's doing okay. The first step of the process after determining the treatment steps and doing the condition report was to do solubility testing. This is to determine if the dyes are stable in every different color on the sampler and to see if the proposed cleaning solution is effective. In this case, I swabbed down a drop of distilled water and placed a small piece of blotter on top and then put everything under a glass weight to make sure that there was good contact. All of the blotters came out clean with no dye bleed, so everything was stable and I was able to proceed using water. Next was to disengage the textile from the board. Thankfully, the sampler was only adhered on the edges. Sometimes, if you're not lucky, they are fully pasted down. I first loosened the bottom right corner with swabs and distilled water, and thank goodness the adhesive was very water soluble. Once I had a good portion of the corner unadhered, I was able to insert a brass quote unquote knife of sorts. I originally bought this to use with my heating iron, but it didn't fit into the heating iron. I also tried sort of warming it up on a mug warmer, but that wasn't very useful. Thankfully, the adhesive easily released from the board, so I was able to just skim it along, taking the board up with it. So as you can see, I have gotten it off of the board. That was way easier than I thought it was gonna be. This little guy that I bought for this project actually does not fit into my soldering iron. Um, but this adhesive, whatever it is, is very, very soluble in water and also was not very well attached to the board. So I was able to just use this to easily get under the adhesive and to detach the adhesive from the board. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take as much adhesive off as I can manually, just with tweezers and this whole thing. As long as I'm not taking up a lot of the textile, it should be a-okay. And then using just water with cotton swabs to sort of take off the remainder. And that should, that should do the trick. So that was way easier than I thought it was gonna be. I wanna show you the back too. To flip this over you can see just how much more brilliant that color is on the back look at that absolutely gorgeous and when we did the solubility testing it didn't look like anything was soluble so we might be able to wet clean this which would be really amazing because it definitely could use it I then removed as much of the adhesive as I could manually with tweezers. A lot of it chipped off super easily, but I made sure to back off if there was any resistance from the fibers.
For the more pesky patches of adhesive, I dampened a piece of batting and put it under weight to soak through the adhesive and really soften it up. The batting really spread out the water into the sampler, which ended up creating faint tide lines. These were rectified in the bathing process, but if I were to do this again, I would have used a low percent egg roast gel and or a suction plate to really control that amount of water. I unfortunately did not have access to these during this treatment, but if I was in a more conventional textile lab, I would have definitely looked into those. Once the adhesive was wetted out and softened, I manually removed it with tweezers. Next, it was time for the wet cleaning. I used a photo tray and distilled water. I filled up the tray and allowed the sampler to soak. If you look closely at this time lapse, you can see the acidic degradation byproducts seeping into the bath, that hallmark kind of yellowy color. I then drained the water and applied a 1% Orvis solution with a cloth. Orvis is a mild detergent commonly used in textile conservation and for washing livestock. I then rinsed out the Orvis with another bath. Off camera, I finished the rinses and laid the sampler out to dry on a cotton towel. Now it was time to create the new mount. I carefully measured the sampler because textiles are not square, they never are, and did the calculations for the boards. For the mount, I reused an acid-free box that I had hanging around, gluing two of the sheets together, making sure to cross flute them, and used PVA glue to adhere them together. I let this dry under a significant amount of weight. I ended up squaring up the edges of the board a little bit and used double stick tape to adhere cotton batting onto the front. Ideally, I would have used polyester batting, but this is what I had on hand. I then covered the mount in muslin, stretched it, and taped it to the back of the board. I trimmed everything and laid out the show fabric, which was a gray cotton. I stretched that and pinned it into place, made any adjustments I needed to. I secured the corners with a couple of stitches. <laughs> and used large whip stitches to add extra tension to the mount. I added a show fabric back to the mount and folded it under and stitched everything into place. I measured how far into the mount I wanted the piece to sit, pinned everything, and thread marked where the sampler should be. I then put the sampler on and pinned it in place using entomology pins. I then secured the sampler with long and short stitches. These are essentially perpendicular stitches in varying lengths along the edge of the sampler. The idea behind these stitches is that they are varied in length so that there is no single line of stress on the edge of the piece, hopefully preventing or reducing breakage over time. I used a curved needle for this process. I love using curved needles, but they do have a steep learning curve if you've never used one. I could easily catch the layers of the mount and the sampler in one swift motion. And that is the treatment complete. There's not a lot of visible change in the before and after photos, but the mount is much improved, and I'm glad to have gotten all that adhesive off the sampler so it doesn't oxidize or do weird things over time. It's now ready to be framed and hung back up on the wall. So I hope you enjoy that conservation treatment of Jane Bird's 1870 sampler. And if you would like to come around this channel for more conservation treatments, discussions of dress history, and sewing adventures, you can of course subscribe down below. You can also go over to my TikTok and Instagram pages, both costume and conservation. I update those sometimes. Uh, this is definitely my main social media hub, however. So otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic day. Bye!